sing that again. Give me oil. Give me oil in my land. Keep me bread in the pattern. Give me oil in my land. I pray. Give me oil in my land. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Now everybody sing. Joy in my heart, keep me singing. Singing, singing. Give me joy in my heart, I pray. Give me joy in my heart, keep me singing, singing, singing. Keep me singing till the break of day. Ladies, the scale. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord, take a moment and just praise the Lord. Just lift up your voices. Tell Him you love Him. Thank Him. Just worship Him a moment. We love you, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. We bless your holy name. There's no other like you. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, it, it's a poem. And it has uh, two words to it. And the whole thing has these two words. And you've heard a lot about it so far this morning. And I thought that was going real, real well. Because the title is His Word. That's it. So, here we go. I drove many nails when I was a youth. But they were driven through me because I spoke the truth. What I had said, not all wanted to hear, because the unknown holds a strange kind of fear. Men never will know what I am saying until they mingle my words with intensive praying. My blood flowed profusely to cleanse each man of sin. All who refuse this cannot possibly win. The prize is well worth it. It's eternal salvation. I offer it to all and each and every nation. To suffer and then die was not my greatest care. It's when my father turned away. That was so hard to bear. My resurrection was the victory that man had waited for. It's what I had but prophesied that opened up the door. Tear this temple down, I said. I'll rebuild it in three days. My father knew what lay ahead for all who'd follow my ways. I have trod this earth for you as none have ever done. And all I ask is that you believe that I am God's risen son. Amen. Ron, that was one of your best. That was beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ron. So. Uh, don't forget our Wednesday night service. We're going through a wonderful series called The Blessed Life with uh, Robert Morris. It's fantastic. I got to, I missed the video the week before, and it is so good. So please come at 6.30 p.m. All right. Secondly, um, I have the sign-up sheet for our Gifts of the Holy Spirit conference with Dr. David Lim that I know many of you have already signed up for. Fantastic. And if you haven't, it is not too late to sign up. Uh, there's a cost of $25 per person 
which covers the conference and two books. We do, we're all basically out of books, but we will have books at the conference for you. So you will get your books if you paid or you haven't paid yet. You can pay at the conference or you can pay right after the service. I'll be out there afterwards. So if you'd like to pay ahead of time, you can, uh, but it's gonna be incredible. Yeah, those of you that were here when Dr. Lim spoke, um, uh, a couple Sundays ago, it was, was that last, last Sunday? Sunday. Yeah, yeah, last Sunday. Wasn't that incredible? Yeah. He's so great, and I'm so excited about it. Yeah. Yes, so anyway, I'm gonna pass the sign-up sheet over starting on this side of the room. And we wanna make sure it gets through everyone so everybody has a chance to sign up. All right, then, two pages of announcements, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. All right, um, so, kind of mark this in your calendar if you can or in your in your head that um, not this week but next week is that right Easter week right. unbelievable yeah. wow it's coming right up isn't it yeah Easter is April 9th this year and so um, as we've kind of started a tradition of having a Maundy Maundy Thursday service which is going to be on Thursday April 6th which is the Thursday prior to Easter and Monday, Thursday represents the night before Jesus was betrayed. And it's a very um, wonderful service. It's going to be on at 6.30 in lieu of our normal Wednesday night service. Next week, we're going to have the Monday, uh, uh, Monday Thursday service. And it's uh, yeah. Monday, Thursday. Yeah, yeah Monday, yeah. Thursday. Yes. So anyway, um, that's another thing that's so wonderful to prepare our hearts and our minds for Easter and to focus on the scripture and the true meaning of Easter. You want to add anything? No. Okay. Just All right. We do want to, that's the, is this the last announcement to thank our um, folks who, um, that's I would say the dates lady. Yeah. yeah. And so a couple things coming up for the ladies, just to mark your calendar, save the date. Uh, if you would like to come, the Assemblies of God is having a uh, women's conference and uh, we're invited now that we're part of the Assemblies of God, and it's from 10 to 2 p.m. at Trinity Life Center on Tax Day, April 15th. And um, they're having three speakers, and even I am speaking. So anyway, if you'd like to come. And then also, our ladies' tea is going to be on Saturday, May 20th. And our very own Rhonda Howard is going to be speaking. So put that on your calendar as well. And just quickly, I'd like to thank um, the volunteers. Uh, a lot of you probably didn't know, but uh, once a month, the Assemblies of God pastors in town uh, meet for breakfast, and then they have a, a meeting and have a speaker. And uh, this month, we hosted it on Tuesday, and it was quite an ordeal. Uh, uh, Jim was out of town. Jim's always the right-hand guy to handle these things, but the Areola brothers stepped up to bat, and... Uh, so I, so I want to thank uh, Greg and Rich and their mama, Ariola, and Don Morris, and John and Joan Bruno, and Ernie and Zena Beaulieu, and Peggy Sutter. Where's Peggy today? And Janeth. Oh, boy. Yeah, we need to pray for him. So uh, also Janeth and Bill Witter and, and Ron Young and uh, so many. Uh, Oh, Vicky made the arrangements. I don't want to forget Vicky. And uh, so uh, everybody came together. And I'll tell you, it, you know, anytime we have something at this church, we, you know, it represents our church. And it was just beautifully, beautifully done. And we're the only Assembly of God church that not only had, we had two kinds of scrambled eggs. We had two kinds of hash browns. We had bacon. We had sausage. We had bagels. We had yogurt. We had donuts. And we had an juice and we had an omelet bar the only only the only one i've been to they had an omelet bar and rich and his mother were back there flipping omelets for people so <laughs> so thank you very much and uh let's just take a we we took a few pictures so here's a chance to just kind of look at what happened as you can see the kitchen is crowded it was very dark that day The omelet bar. Dr. Lim. Some of these faces are very familiar. <laughs> Mama getting ready to flip one. Yeah.
Oh, that's last week with Dr. Lim. You remember him. And he'll be here next week. And I think that's it. Yeah. Just like showing slides. Maybe next week I'll show some slides from an old vacation. <laughs> if John Bruno will come forward, John and Joan are hosting today. And uh, I asked him if he would uh, pray for the offering. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I had a question. Have you ever thought about uh, your house keys, about your physical set of keys? Put the mic a little closer. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about your house keys, your physical set of keys? The keys in your possession represent the right and privilege that you have. They enable you to enter through a doorway into a, a secure doorway that no one else can enter. Your keys represent your ownership, your authority, and your right of access. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bound on earth shall be, shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. In both the Old and the New Testaments, keys symbolize power and authority. Isaiah 22, 22 refers to the keys of the house of David. Revelation 3, 7 mentions the keys of death in Hades, and in Luke 1152, Jesus claims that the experts in the Jewish law have taken away the key of knowledge. The first thing to understand is that the keys of the kingdom give access to the kingdom of heaven. The key that gives us the access to the kingdom of heaven is recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. When you recognize Jesus is the anointed one to redeem you from your sins and you put your complete trust in him, you gain access to the kingdom of heaven. Does this mean we stand as judges over people? No. But we do have the authority to go and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, which will allow people to enter the kingdom. The final authority rests in the gospel itself. So the keys of the kingdom are God's gift to his people to state heaven's verdict on who will and who will not enter the kingdom based on their response to the gospel. Use the keys to access heaven's resources for your earthly situations. Use the authority they give you to share the gospel and open the kingdom of heaven to others. Since Jesus has given you the keys, he expects you to use them. Because when you look close, the keys are not just for you, but they're for those around you. There are a lot of people locked up right now looking for a key to get out. You have those keys, now let's get them out. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you paid the price so we could be saved. We pray that your Holy Spirit strengthens us in your wisdom and knowledge and makes us bold Christians in faith. We pray for your, for your spirit to move freely through today's service and comfort those in need. Now we'll uh, pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive, forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> uh, as uh, I get ready to share the word today, uh, we join me in a word of prayer, and we want to pray uh, for, for Dennis, uh, Peggy's husband. So, F Father, we come to you, and... Uh, Lord, we first of all, uh, in hearing this situation, Lord, we're thankful that we can come before you, Lord, and lift up Dennis and Peggy, Lord, at, at the hospital. And we pray, Father, that your hand be on him. And we pray, Lord, for, for healing, whatever this is. And we pray for comfort. And we pray direct those doctors and those uh, medical authorities, Lord, to uh, find out exactly what's wrong and, and bless him. And Lord, I also come dependent on you to speak through me today, Lord. I know that nothing can be accomplished outside of you, Lord. I can't do it myself. So you know, Lord, I've gathered the material. And I ask you, Lord, to set it ablaze this morning as we come I'm looking at the words of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, for the teachings of Scripture and for your word. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we're on the final message uh, in our series, Mountaintop Lessons for Mountaintop Living. And I hope that you've, um, you know, you can find the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel 
in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And I hope as we've been going through this for the last, uh, actually, uh, six other Sundays, today the 7th, that, that you uh, have been reading uh, on your own, just reading through the Sermon on the Mount, these teachings that actually were a seminar. It wasn't just one sermon, but it was actually a, a series of, of teachings. And the bottom line is, if, if we follow the teachings of Jesus, if we obey what Jesus tells us to, and for most of us, if you're anything like me, it takes a while to really get obedient. But I'll tell you, it's, it's the best life. It's, it's the abundant life that Jesus told us and promised us we could have, but it's in following him. So uh, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, in our last meeting, not last week, but the week before. And we're in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, the last part of that chapter, and starting in verse 12. And Jesus said this, so in everything you do, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Now this is commonly known, as we all know, as uh, the golden rule. And many religions state this, this same thing rather similarly, but they reverse it. They say, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. But by stating it positively, Jesus makes it more significant. Uh, you know, at times, uh, if you're anything like me, and I know a lot of you are like me, you just want to smack someone up the side of the head. <laughs> Hopefully they're not here today with you. <laughs> you know, you might feel like flooring the gas pedal, you know, to chase some cowboy that nearly caused an accident on 95. You know what I mean? You just really want to, that road rage kind of feeling, but... But you control yourself, you know, you calm down and, and you don't uh, make things even worse. So you can control that. But, you know, it, it's more difficult to consciously and consistently uh, take the initiative and, and do good things for other people. Thanks to Joyce Meyer. Now, I think I was pretty good at this before that, but I really uh, am cautious and have been for 20 some years in returning my shopping cart at the grocery store. If you listen to Joyce Meyer, just these little things. And you know, it is the truth. If you don't obey God in little things, you are not going to obey him in big things. And so, you know, why, why would I do that? Because, you know, I want to do to others what I would want done. For one thing, I don't appreciate it if a cart rolls into my car. There are dents in my car. I bought it used and I, I even leave, if you look at the front of my car, it's banged up. That was from the previous owners. People stop me a lot of times and they say, hey, I can, you can push, you know, dent that out or push it out and everything. And I say, no, thanks. I, I, I like the look of it. It reminds me of Judy and John Joslia, <laughs> who previously smashed up the front of the car. Uh, but, you know, these cars roll in to, and dent. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but when I go into a parking lot and I see an open space and I'm ready to pull into it and then there's a cart sitting there and I got to get out of the car and I got to move it. And if I worked at Smith's or Target or uh, Walmart or whatever, I, I really would appreciate it if the carts were all back in one place and I don't have to run all over the, you know, the place. So doing unto others what you would do to you. I was at Smart and Final. Uh, I had a lot of running around to do for that breakfast. And so I was buying supplies at Smart and Final and I brought uh, the cart out to my car and put the stuff in my car. And I went to return the cart, and I saw there were probably six or seven other carts just all over the place. So I took a couple of them, and I wheeled them, like three of them, you know, back. I couldn't, I wasn't going to do the whole lot. I didn't have time, but I thought, okay, let me do what I can. So I wheeled three carts back, and some lady was coming out with her cart, and she said, aren't you nice? Yeah, well, yeah, she's right. Uh, <laughs> but number one is, <laughs> it's an example, but it's doing unto others. What? Uh, yeah, I don't, you know. You know, I'm generally a, a, a generous tipper when you go to a restaurant, you know, because I've, I've done food service a couple of times. Not often, but I've, I've worked as a waiter. And um, I have a pastor friend. We go to lunch fairly frequently. And other various times we've gone to a buffet. And he, and he always says, well, I don't know why we have to tip much or tip anything because we're doing all the work, you know. Well, he obviously has never been on his feet for eight hours, picking up plates in a buffet, bringing drinks. You know, that's, that's hard work. I, I have, so when I'm with him, I always feel like I've got to lay out a few more dollars to make sure, you know, <laughs> the witness is kept, you know. I, um, 
over 30 years ago, I was you know, still performing, but I was going back to school, and I, rem I had just I'd taken this couple of literature classes, and I was determined, because show business disrupts everything. You have a job out of town all of a sudden, and so, you, you know, so I thought, I am going to complete this semester. So I, I uh, to keep money on the table, I got a job at Marie Callender's. And so I had this, uh, I was there about nine months until I was delivered. And I had this couple come in, uh, they were all like in their 60s. And uh, they had a daughter at that time, about my age, in, in her 30s. And they, they liked me, they would come in and uh, kind of like once a week. So they came in this one Friday night and um, they had their dinner and I gave them the excellent service that I always give, gave people. And uh, went at the end of the meal, they had these little cards you could buy. It was like a fundraiser thing. And uh, among other businesses, if you went to Marie Callender's and you bought an entree, you showed that card and you got a free slice of pie. So I went over to ask if they wanted dessert and the daughter and the, and the father both wanted pie. But the mother said, well, uh, I'm not real big on pie, but I would like a really, you know, if, if you had Sundays, well, we didn't have Sundays. But I went back and we did have ice cream. So I ran back, got the pie, found a little bowl, scooped out some ice cream, put some whipped cream on it. We had that, I ran to the bar, put a maraschino cherry on it, put a little umbrella on it, put some chocolate sprinkles on it, did the best I could. Brought it to the table. This lady was just so impressed with that little touch, you know. So I was off the weekend, and when I came in Monday to work for lunch, one of the managers said, uh, we, we have a, a, a card. Some woman brought a card in to you. How do you rate that your customers bring you cards? So I, uh, before work, I opened the card, and uh, it ba basically said, uh, I don't know if you remember us. I came in with my parents. Of course, I remembered them. I've seen them a number of times. And she said, uh, my mother was so impressed that you made a Sunday for her. And he, she said, that night my mother died. Oh. I know, that was my, <gasps> I hope she wasn't allergic to maraschino cherries. <laughs> but she explained that her mother had, had had cancer. And so they weren't sure you know, when she was going to die. But she said, I want you to know that the whole evening we went home and we were watching television and all my mother talked about was that waiter and that Sunday. Oh. Doing unto others, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's amazing. We, we don't normally get to see uh, a response to a lot of our actions. But I got to that night. Jim Pop and I went to Wendy's after we cleaned that closet. <laughs> we went to uh, Wendy's to have a, a bite and uh, the real sweet girl behind the counter. And... Uh, you know, I, I always like to tip fast food workers because they don't see tips. So I gave her like five dollars, five little. She said, you made my day. <laughs> and I said, well, you made my day because she really did. To, to see her smile and that reaction, just doing unto others, you know. We represent the Lord. And, you know, not only as a pastor, but just as a Christian. You know, people don't know when I'm out that I'm a pastor. They don't know anything about me, you know, any more than they know about any of us. But uh, I think it's vitally important to express thanks to people. You know, you're invited to somebody's house for dinner. When somebody does something nice for you, I always try to write a note. It's just my, my thing. Because I think they don't have to do nice things for you, you know. And so when you go to somebody's house for dinner or they just do something nice, I, I express it. I know the effort and the expense and the time. And so just generally, you know, being nice to people, being polite to people. You know, we live, we're in a time where, where it's a really nasty, mean, vindictive world, isn't it? And you watch the news and, I mean, just the way people treat one another. And uh, we should stand out in the crowd. You know, we, we live in a kingdom of light, and our, our actions should reflect the light of Christ. So in verse 13, in chapter 7, we pick up, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now Jesus begins by telling his listeners that, the gate that leads to heaven and to the kingdom of heaven is narrow. 
In John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 7 through 9, Jesus said this, Verily, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pastors. Now, Jesus didn't mean that it was difficult to come into the kingdom to become a Christian, but the only one gate leads to knowing God and leads to eternal life. And only a few discover it. You know, we're, we're few, not just in this church, but really Christians on the planet compared to the n number of people walking the planet now and through the centuries. We're very few. And many people think it's unfair that God only has one way. You'll see resistance when you share the gospel and you tell them that they need to come to the Lord through the sacrifice of Christ. And we've all heard people get upset about this narrow way. And they so often you hear, well, how about all the millions of people over in this part of the world or the millions of people over in this part of the world? Never heard about Jesus. Well, that's up to the Lord. And that's why the Lord tells us to go out and tell, you know, to spread the gospel. Years back in the film, Oh God, I don't know if you, any of you go way back like I do, back, uh, back in the 70s, there was a film, Oh God, and it starred John Denver. I was always a big John Denver fan. And uh, the part of God was played by George Burns. And you might remember. And uh, so the premise of the film was that God, George Burns, had chosen um, John Denver, who, was a, who managed a supermarket, to put out his word. And... Uh, at one point, now it was written by Carl Reiner, Jewish man. You know, a lot of you remember Carl Reiner from the Dick Van Dyke show and other places. And um, at one, toward the end of the film, uh, God was revealing himself. George Burns was revealing himself. And, and a reporter asked him, is, is Jesus the son of God? And God, George Burns answered, yes, Jesus is my son. Muhammad is my son. Buddha is my son. Very unbiblical. Don't tell me there's only one way. You know, it's, it's interesting. You were, uh, Kathy was mentioning about the man with cancer and, and this remedy, you know, that has so far helped him. And when people are in a desperate situation like, like cancer, generally, when the doctor says, here's, here's the remedy, people are not, don't say, oh, you know, that's the only way, I'm sorry, if that's the only way, I don't want to, you know, don't want to take it, you know. But they resist Jesus. Jesus is the only way to come into the kingdom of God. And he alone died for our sins and makes us acceptable. You know, when we come, you know, when we come to God through Christ, it all makes sense, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's something that these supernatural things that really make, that shouldn't, that should be very, very difficult for us to understand. The virgin birth, you know. Jonah in the whale or in the fish not actually a whale it says a big fish and but yet Jesus acknowledged those things Noah and the flood these are these are things that the carnal mind doesn't grasp and the sacrifice of Jesus for salvation but it all makes sense and because it's a small gate and it's a narrow road that leads to life Jesus acknowledges that only a few find it you know if you only have a few dollars in your wallet you're probably not going to go to Lowry's for lunch, right? If you've lost your job and you only have a little food, you know, a can of beans, a can of soup, an apple, it looks pretty bleak, you know. It's that word few. But again, millions find Christ. I mean, Stephanie and I watch various programs Sunday morning that are on and you see these uh, pastors with massive churches, you know, stadiums in some cases like Joel Osteen it looks like so many people believe but again of the masses they're few and then then you wonder even in the in the big churches or even in a church like this how many firmly believe in Jesus so most of the Jews in Jesus day rejected him remember few let me throw something else concerning these words out that um, I think there's another layer to this and I think, uh, Ron, it is in John's Gospel, chapter 7 again. Enter through the, is that in it? Enter through the narrow gate that came up? 
No, that's a different one. But let me just read this again. Maybe it's Matthew's. I, I wrote something down here wrong. But Jesus said this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So, you know, I believe as, when we, as we grow in Christ, when we mature in Christ, the road gets narrower. The road gets narrower. And I believe uh, that the wider road, you know, if you're brand new in the Lord, you're a brand new Christian, uh, the road is a little wider because you're new, yet you haven't matured yet, you know. And so we can, there are those times that um, I think that if you're new in the Lord, uh, it's kind of like you don't expect a two-year-old to do what a 20-year-old does and can do. You don't expect a 20-year-old to act like a 40-year-old because of just experience in life. But I also think that there are many Christians that have never really matured the way they're intended to. They can be, you can be a Christian 40 years and still be a baby. Paul talked about that to the church. He said, by now, many of you, you should be teaching but you're still on basically pablum, you know, still on milk. So over time, our, our, our interest in life narrow. I know they have for me. It's just, you know, you begin to think, you know, when you read the words of, of Solomon and he talks about the vanity, you know, as, he, as an older man, just the vanity of, of things, the things that were so important at one stage of your life. But again, growing in the things of God and narrowing our interests and living more fully for Jesus John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. And, and that's maturity in the Lord. He must increase. When I was a younger Christian, um, I thought I loved Jesus. And I did, I did love Jesus, a younger Christian. But the road in my life was a lot wider. And now my life is just more self uh, Christ-centered. And you know, I've been in the Lord 50 years. <laughs> you know, that's a long time. But to be honest, I think the first half of my Christian life, first 25 years, I wasn't loose. But in the last 25, 30 years, the, the obedience factor has become much more uh, focused in my life. So, you know, you can be a Christian on a wider road and you can be a Christian on a more narrow road. And if you put your faith in Christ, bottom line is you're going to go to heaven. But there are going to be a lot of us that won't experience the treasures in the next life that God has for those who really walk a narrow way. I was thinking of uh, yesterday, a number of us were at the Walk for Life uh, First Choice Pregnancy Center. And the director has been here, Deborah uh, Costello. And she shared her testimony about her parents that... Uh, they raise 11, I think 11 kids. I get lost. There are so many of them. In fact, her father just died. And she was showing us pictures last Monday of, um, of all her brothers and sisters and their mates and their children. You know, and it's like, whoa. You know, I mean, it's like a town, you know. So her parents were, were solid Christians from the Midwest. And they moved to the Los Angeles area and, and rented or bought a house uh, in, in a heavy gang area. Uh, Hispanic gangs and with these 11 kids would take in drug addicts or alcoholics and uh, to nurture people to disciple people and help them and it's like wow these people her father used to take uh, Deborah as a little girl she was five years old he'd take her to uh, the abortion clinics and he'd have her at five years old pass out tracts to various people because nobody would not take a tract from a five-year-old little girl you know so Deborah grew up in that, but I, 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 she was talking about her father's uh, recent death and, and the devotion of that man. And he'll receive crowns that so many of us won't. At Tuesday's breakfast, uh, I met this missionary couple who sat at the table. Uh, Rich was just scolding me because I didn't have an omelet. Uh, you know, I picked up the other things. I just had limited, limited time. And so I sat at the table with this missionary couple, Eric and Kimberly Duick, Duick I think it is. But they were uh, both single, and somehow uh, they were serving as single missionaries, and then the Lord brought them together, and they are getting ready their home on sort of a sabbatical where they go from church to church uh, to really raise funds for their, their ministry 
and then they'll return, but they're, they are serving in a Muslim country that borders northern China. And uh, I think it's T Tajikistan where they're going to be. But, you know, can you imagine? And I was talking with her and I said, well, when did you feel this call to go into uh, missionary service? And, and you know what? We're not all called to the same thing. So I'm not laying guilt on anyone if you don't feel called to South America or Africa or anything. That's a call. But, but what a focus on the Lord to leave everything familiar and the conveniences, you know, just the restaurants would kill me if I had to, you know. <laughs> One of the pastors that comes from Africa has been here a couple of times. Um, he, he's encouraged us to, to go uh, and visit them in Africa. But I think, I don't think I could survive the food, you know. I mean, I'm just being honest here. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that, that kind of heart, you know, leave your family, to leave your country, to leave everything that's comfortable and, and to reach people for Christ. Picking up in verse 15, Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. You know, in the Old Testament, there were many false prophets who said what the king wanted to hear or what the people wanted to hear. Jesus is speaking to the people in his day. They were false prophets, and we have false prophets today. And they take the focus off Jesus, and they put it out elsewhere. And, you know, a prime example would be Joseph Smith and the Mormon church. You don't hear about Jesus in that church. You hear Mormon people talk about their church. Our church, our church, our church, our church, our church. Where's Jesus? And denominations, uh, Christian denominations, have twisted scripture because they're afraid that they'll run people off if they really preach what, what the scripture says, you know? And that's false. And TV preachers whose, whose main theme is how special you are. And, and you know what? In God's eyes, we are very, very special, but that can't be the only focus. We need to hear about sacrifice. We need to hear about service. We need to hear about yielding to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells us to evaluate a teacher's life by, or words, by his life or her life. And sometimes that's, that's difficult to do because you can't follow me around all day long, right? Uh. So he says, you know, just as a tree, an apple tree is only going to bear apples. You know, a Christian person, especially a Christian person in leadership, should only bear, you know, we've, we've, we've looked at various uh, major men and women of God that have fallen. Ravi Zacharias, you know, people were shocked to find out there were, when he died, that there was a whole hidden life going on. Bill Hybels with the Willow Tree Church, you know, I went to a conference a number of years ago where it was all about church growth. And here's how to, because Willow Tree Church in the Chicago area is this massive church and, and pastors look to it and we all like to, you know, wow, that kind of success and stuff. But then we found out that, that there was scandal again in his life and and hopefully these men uh, they can repent and they can come back to the Lord so I'm not not throwing stones uh, we're all told to watch lest we fall you know and I always think of what Billy Graham said back in the in the 80s when a number of TV evangelists had fallen and it just seemed like everybody in the world was falling apart in in, in ministry and Billy Graham said every day thousands of planes take off and land take off and land take off and land safely you only hear about the crashes. Basically saying there are so many in Christian ministry that are living solid lives you never hear about and living faithfully. But it really is, it's best to know something about the life of those you listen to and make sure that, that it's not just lip service, but they, that they live that. And this should not encourage witch hunts on the other hand, you know. We're all less than perfect. We all make mistakes, even those of us called to leadership. I need to share with you, last Tuesday, because of the breakfast, I ate seven donuts. <laughs> Not all at once, I took some home. You know, but that's, 
I'm sorry to say, but that's gluttony. I mean, I was eating, watching TV and eating those last five donuts, and it was like, they all tasted delicious, but after about the second one, it was like, where am I going to put these next three? <laughs> just keep chewing, just keep swallowing. <laughs> I have my devotion time during the day, but at the end of the day, I'm tired, and it might surprise you to hear that I don't read the Bible, really, most of the time at the end of the day. I'm watching TV. Currently, we're watching... DVD reruns of Green Acres. <laughs> it's a good escape, you know. Don't have to think, you know. Oliver, you know. Remember that show? I made your favorite, fried oatmeal. Oh, Lisa, you don't make fried oatmeal. Golly, Mrs. Douglas, fried oatmeal, my favorite. You know, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a lot cheaper than booze, you know. Years back when I was in my 20s, uh, I dated the pastor's daughter and uh, was over at their house. You know, and I saw him on the platform, he a dynamic preacher, but it was like eight o'clock at night and he came out of the hallway in red pajamas. I almost lost it. I mean, to one thing, see your pastor in his pajamas, but red pajamas, that shook me up. Huh. Now, I just encourage you, read, Read 1 Timothy chapter 3, the first 12 verses, not now, but 1 Timothy chapter 3, because it outlines what a church leader, and not just pastor, but an elder, a deacon, anybody in leadership in the church, this is the kind of life they should, they should lead. Matthew uh, verse 21, this is going to shake you up a little. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Now, these words scare the daylights a lot of, out of a lot of Christians. And if it really sobers you up and shakes you up a little bit, it probably doesn't apply to you. Probably doesn't relate to you. If you have that tenderness, oh God, I want to make sure I'm right with you. But he says, not everyone who says to me, the Lord, Lord, enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What's the will of my Father who is in heaven? That they come to him through his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the first, that's the entry, that's the gate. And there are many that are in uh, ministry in various forms that don't have a relationship. Maybe like me, you grew up in a, in a church that, you know, we revered our pastor. We really are, you know, the expression was if, if he doesn't go to heaven, nobody's going to heaven because, you know, he looked good in his suit. And, you know, we saw him for a few minutes on Sunday morning and we were just short. And, and I, you know what? I think, think that man was a very good and honest and decent Man, but we were never told in our church how to come into relationship with Jesus. We never heard about Christ coming back. We never heard about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We didn't know any of that. And after, after we became Christians, my mother and another lady in the church who uh, had come to know the Lord went back to our pastor who was now retired because they wanted to make sure that he was born again. And so they shared the gospel with this man who had been in ministry his whole life. And he said, oh, you sound like a friend of mine that... You know, he, he didn't receive it. I shared um, a number of years ago, we went back uh, to Pennsylvania because my cousin's daughter was getting married. And the man she was marrying, her husband-to-be, uh, his parents were, uh, his mother had been a former nun. And she had um, met her, uh, I guess she, she worked with a lady in, the, in school uh, that would take her home. And she met... Uh, her friend's brother, and they became interested in each other. And so she uh, said she took a year to decide whether God would have her stay in the convent or whether uh, she would serve the Lord as a wife and a mother. So when we went to the, uh, when we were at the wedding, right after the wedding service was over, as people are mulling around, you know, before they have dinner and people are talking and they're taking pictures of the bridal party, we went over to the bride's parents and they shared with us again that, uh, that she had been a nun formerly, and, and her husband said to me, he said, before I met Marie, 
I, I was an atheist. And then he looked me straight in the face and he said, but I'm still searching. Well, I began to share the gospel with him. And I shared so much and there was time for dinner. And I said, Tim, do you want to hear more about Jesus? And he said, yes. I said, well, after dinner, I'll come and get you. So I came and got him after the, the uh, groom danced with his mother. And we went to a little private area in this social hall. And I began to share Jesus with him. Well, in the midst of it, there was a lady standing right outside the door uh, who was a security guard, a black lady. And she came in and she was outside having a cigarette. And she said, I'm listening to you outside the door. Do you, I'm a Christian. Do you mind if I sit in here with you? And I said to Tim, you wanna, you mind if she sits here? So I began to share more about how to come to Christ. And I, then I said, Tim, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? And he said, yeah, do you want to pray? So the three of us, Tim and me and the security guard, joined hands. And Tim asked the Lord to come into his life. Well, right about that time, as soon as we finished the prayer, Tim's wife, the former nun, came up to us. And she was sharing. She said, I'm so glad that our son is marrying Laura. Because she said, we raised him Catholic. But he doesn't go to church. And we know Laura goes to church. And we don't care that she's Protestant. And it doesn't matter if, if, if she's Muslim. I mean, my heart stopped. You are kidding me. She's the, she's, she was the bride of Christ, you know. And she doesn't care. She doesn't know enough to know that, that there's only one way. So her husband, before he left the reception that night, he came up to me. His people were, you know, most of the people were gone from the reception. And on their way out, he said to me, the main reason I came here tonight was to meet Jesus. His son was getting married. You know, he saw the difference. So the next year, I'm telling you all this, we, we, when we went home, we wanted to make sure that we had a chance to share the gospel with the former nun. So I had my cousin set up a dinner arrangement with Tim and his wife. And we all met for dinner. And, and Stephanie and I were sitting by Marie, the former nun. And we shared with her about being born again. And we looked at John 3.3. 3. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And we laid that out to her. And she was not willing to accept it. She was not willing. And, you know, that's really sad. You know, she has since died. A few years later, she died. And I don't know what happened between the time we spoke to her and her death. But again, these people who think they know the Lord, it's, it, it is a very serious thing. But to comfort all of the rest of you living here and serving the Lord, Romans says this in Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved from what? Saved from separation from God. Saved from a wasted life. And saved from a heap of trouble. You know, even as a Christian, I got into enough trouble. I had enough mess, but I can't even imagine my life if I hadn't been wrestling with the Lord, you know? And I don't know about you, but I thank God every single day that I'm in the kingdom of God. I thank God every single day that I know him. Nothing like it. It's the, it's the life. So Jesus' closing remarks uh, to his several days of teaching is what we're going to look at here for just the next couple of minutes. And we could spend many, many, many more weeks. You know, we never exhaust the Bible. You know, we can, we can do a series, but we've just scratched the surface on a lot of this stuff, you know. So Jesus says this in concluding starting in verse 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Remember that old Sunday school song, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came up, uh, what was it? Floods came up. It's been a long time. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> but next week, yeah. Uh, verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand 
And the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who has authority and not as their teachers of the law. The key to an unshakable life is not only hearing what Jesus teaches, but doing it. What's the company that says, just do it, you know? Just do it. James 1, and verse 25 in uh, James, God, in James uh, letter, says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Whoever looks intently at the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Blessed. So the really, the way we know that we know that we know what we know when it comes to scripture is we're doing it. We're just doing it. And as I shared, the first half of my Christian life, you know, I... I, I obeyed in many ways, but uh, in many ways I didn't, you know. But what wasn't convenient, what was a little bit hard, sometimes I shied away from, I'll just concentrate on the things I do well, you know. I know the perfect law that gives freedom, and I know what it is to be blessed when I started obeying, doing what Jesus teaches. I love the life I have in the Lord, and, and I hope you do too. I hope you love the life you have in the Lord. And I love the call God's given me. And we're all, we all have a call. And some of us have things behind the scenes, like Tuesday when we met. You know, Ron's back there. Nobody's paying attention to him most of the time. You know, but, but that's a major ministry. Without it, you saw what happens when you can't get the words on the screen, you know. And so many behind the scenes, but, but those are major ministries. The call. And, and you feel this, Fulfillment when you're doing what you know God's called you to do. And I never, I've said this many times in, in my later years, which I'm in my later years. You know, I celebrated last uh, January, my next 70 years. <laughs> but it's later, you know. <laughs> but I never would have guessed how joyous life could be over the age of 55 and over the age of 60. And now over the age of 70. It's, it's an abundant life. It's mountaintop living if we live according to his word. Let's close in prayer. Lord, what a blessing it is, first of all, to come into your kingdom. And we're so thankful, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. That you are patient with us. And so many of us can relate to that, Lord, that we, it took us a long time. It takes us a long time to finally figure it out. And we, we stumble and we fall and we make these mistakes because we do things our own way. And then we finally get smart and say, yeah, you know, if I think I'll just do it God's way and it becomes so much easier. So we thank you, Lord, for the words of Jesus, wonderful words of life as the old hymn celebrates wonderful words of life and we're thankful holy spirit that you just keep convicting us and directing us tapping us on the shoulder patiently and leading us and sometimes spanking us to get us to live mountaintop living according to your way according to your will according to your words so thank you for this time together lord i pray that these words will not fall to the ground but that they will bless your sheep, that we would grow up, that we'd be mature in our faith, that we'd be fervent in our devotion to you, and that we'd be a great light in our portion of the world, Father. We love you. We thank you for this time together, and I pray a blessing on each one that's come under this roof. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen.